I had the opportunity to visit with distinguished jazz and classical French hornist and teacher Richard Todd at the Frost School of Music at Miami University. Our discussions focused on Horn Sonata No. 1, which was especially written for him in summer 2010 and debuted the same year at the Frost School of Music, October 26th. The sonata was inspired by three legendary jazz beboppers of the 20th century, all of whom contributed enormously to America's rich musical history. The first movement, bop improvisers would often deploy phrases over an odd number of bars and overlap their phrases across bar lines and across major harmonic cadences. Charlie Christian and other early boppers would also begin stating a harmony in their improvised line before it appeared in the song form, being outlined by the rhythm section. This momentary dissonance creates a strong sense of forward motion in the improvisation and was one of the inspirations for the movement's material. Richard talks about the unique qualities of this sonata, using articulation as a concept to create phrases, the importance of dance to enhance the jazz waltz feel of this movement, but, as Richard tells us, it's not really a traditional waltz as horn players are used to. Let's listen to Richard. So the thing about this piece is putting the right kind of sound and air into the instrument. If you, it, it, I think it's really important to just basically just don't push the air, just play it. And just don't push the articulation, just let it happen. And don't over length notes, because that's not going to work either. The basic idea of this thing is... And if you try to play that too long... You see, the, the feeling is all wrong. You have to really play with a different sense of style than you would... Um, any sort of classical type repertoire you would think of. The second movement was inspired by listening to Duke Ellington's Black, Brown, and Beige, criticized for its discontinuity and formlessness. Arbitrary classical transitions permeate the work, especially Beige, which goes even further towards a loose, episodic kind of development with almost no recapitulation of previous material. Richard talks about using your air and quality of sound to speak the blues through the horn. He speaks about flexibility of air and embouchure to help the style of the big picture. So the second movement of the sonata um, is, I think, uh, it allows you to, to play, I think, a little bit more traditionally. Um, you can put a little more air into it, you can make a little bit more classical sound, however, I think that the, the fun part about it is is using your air and the, the quality of your sound to kind of make some blues out of all of this. And it's not that hard to do if you uh, just make sure that, that you're allowing your air to be flexible and your, your armature to be flexible. If you're real tight with this thing, it's going to be a real problematic thing. Um, another thing, if you actually look at the, the, the score, if you look at, at the horn part, you're going to see that there's like a lot of turns and so on. Um, they're nice and you can do them, but I think the great, the nice part about this composition is you can leave a couple of them out to kind of help the style of the big picture shaping and phrasing of this of this piece. And uh, if you have a chance to see the video of the original performance, you're also going to kind of notice that there was a spot in the middle of the second movement where we kind of diverged a little bit compositionally from what was on the page. We didn't change anything harmonically we just kind of made it seem like it was a little bit more of a late night piano bar. And um, I think that that's one of the great things about composition when you can kind of take a, take a, a character and expand upon it. And a piece like this allows you to kind of, kind of jump off the track for a second and um, make it your own. So I'm going to play a little bit of the opening of the second movement for you. And I'm going to play it basically very literally. And then I'm going to play it again with using um, a little bit of kind of my own styling on this so that you can kind of hear the differences. I, I will try to play exactly what's on the page. Please forgive me if I omit a note or two because I'm trying to play this from memory. Okay? <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
checking my cheat sheet down here. Now I'm going to play it again. And now I'm going to basically kind of put my own personality into the notes that are actually on the page. <laughs> You can do either one, and either one is actually really quite good. So when you've got a nice line that you're starting with, and you've got the character of the music and such, that, that um, it allows the freedom for a little bit of kind of artistic interpretation, don't be afraid of doing that. I think you'll find out that you'll have a good time with it. The third movement, characterized by a fast tempo and instrumental virtuosity, emphasizes weak beats and off beats. Thelonious Monk's characteristic unorthodox approach to the piano, combining a highly percussive attack with abrupt, dramatic use of silences and hesitations, became a key factor in shaping this movement's structure and phrasing. Richard talks about the importance of letting your air be light, not to be put off by the tempo, and not to be too literal in your interpretation. So the third movement of this sonata is a real kind of tour de force. It's, it challenges everybody, the, the hornist, the pianist. Um, I think that, that, this, the, that the piece really, this one is like, if you don't alter the way you normally play and just let your air be light and fly, you're going to be in big trouble with this thing. Um, it, it plays fabulously once you really kind of get it under your fingers. The funny thing about it is don't be, um, don't be put off by the tempo and by all the notes you've got to play because the thing is is that as you begin to kind of practice this, as you begin to kind of get used to playing it, it begins to fall into place. You start to kind of see patterns emerging and it, 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 you don't have to learn everything kind of line by line. You start to get it and I think that's one of the things that makes it work. Um, a lot of the things that happen in here kind of recur a few times um, and also the middle part of it is actually a little bit compositionally what happens at the beginning he slows everything down a lot and it's it's actually kind of helpful to get it gives you a chance to kind of get your get your uh, feet back underneath you and um, really kind of enjoy the 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 melody kind of you can hear it a little bit better because it flies by pretty quick. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of trills in this thing, and I think that it's considered the, a lot of the trills um, character as much as you do actual literal. I think it's whether or not you actually nail everything exactly as it is is not the point. As much as it is, you know, if you do that you're going to be happy. If you try to be too accurate, you're going to uh, probably uh, bang your head against the wall. This piece, is going to, this piece is going to be a lot of fun to play, and it's going to be a ton of fun for you to work on. So, when I, um, so I'm going to play the beginning of this. Now, I'm going to play it on um, the instrument that I happen to have at the moment, which is my Hoyer 6801. Um, love these horns. But when I actually did the performance um, in Miami, and when I would actually perform it, I have a I have a horn that I play jazz and baroque and so on and so forth. That's the Hoyer RT91 double desk hand, and um, I would tend to play this piece on that instrument because I just love the way it feels when I play it. Um, but I'm going to play it on a on a bigger instrument and hope for the best. Here's the here's the opening of this thing. <laughs> So it basically, you can do it on an instrument like this, it, but as I just kind of showed you just by playing it, if you try to put a lot of air and push air through this thing, you're in big trouble. Just relax, have fun, and um, enjoy the journey of learning how to play this piece. Hear Richard Todd perform excerpts of Horn Sonata Number 1 at ChristopherCaliendo.com. From the home page, select from the right panel, Caliendo YouTube Classical Jazz. 
then select the movements one by one. Music for the Sonata can be purchased in hard copy or as a download. Richard Todd teaches at the Frost School of Music at Miami University, is the first hornist for the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, a Hollywood studio recording musician, and a prolific recording artist. <laughs>